Well, this event has been organized by the uh, Collaborative Working Group on Animal Health and Welfare Research and the Stridas International Research Consortium on Animal Health. So we are very happy of welcoming you here. Um, the aim of this event is to look into the current situation that has been brought up to us from the COVID-19 pandemics and see how uh, we reacted to this emerging disease and what we learned from this experience and to see what veterinary science can contribute in the control or prevention of current and future uh, pandemics either uh, in the animal health sector or in the interface between human and animal health. During this meeting, uh, you will be um, um, interacting and to questions along the room of the webinar, uh, assessing the multimeter app. You will see the screen uh, the link to connect to it so that needs to your phone and the code to be put into this system to be able to provide your answer to the question you'll be sh you'll be seeing shown on the screen. Um, I will now pass the floor to Matteo Sabini from the Agency for the Promotion of European Research in Italy. who will guide you through a quick demonstration of the way this Mentimeter app works, and will guide you through a few questions for making you more familiar with the system. Matteo, the floor is yours. So thank you everybody, thanks uh, Stefano, thanks to all speakers, and uh, thanks to the people that is uh, joining now. Uh, so I saw already some uh, uh, comments in the chat from people coming from Nepal and so on. So uh, it's, uh, we have uh, a lot of people, 300 people, and uh, during this event we would like to involve you uh, in, uh, in interaction uh, uh, in order to collect some uh, uh, feedback uh, and ideas from you. As Stefan was saying, now I'm going to uh, share my screen. So please, uh, uh, in the meantime, go to uh, menti.com and uh, uh, some of you already did. Uh, and please uh, write on your smartphone uh, and let, uh, let us know uh, who do you work for? If you work for a research institution or academia, that's uh, at the moment is the majority of you. Uh, if you are working in a research funding body, in public health services, uh, in veterinary service, in industry, government, international organization, or for NGO or media. Um, you will see that during the event, uh, we will try to assess the issue in a, a multidisciplinary way wave uh, way uh, so uh, it's uh, it is good so good to have uh, many different people representing different stakeholders and different entities okay research and academia are the majority so i see that uh, we are around 300 people in the room uh, but uh, at the moment uh, only 160 people replied so uh, i remember you uh, use your smartphone to go to menti.com and then put the code that is uh, uh, 510051 and uh, reply to this question. This is just uh, um, a breaking uh, game, uh, but uh, you will see that during the um, roundtable, we will directly involve you asking some questions. And uh, after this uh, question, there, there is another uh, another question uh, where we will try to assess uh, uh, where you come from. So please enter. Let's wait just for uh, another minute, and then we will skip. We'll go to the uh, next uh, to the next uh, uh, slide. I see that now that the people participating is in, the number of the people is increasing, um, and uh, we have uh, now more than 200 people. That are, that, uh, that are interacting with us. And uh, I really hope that uh, uh, the, the number will increase and that uh, you will give us uh, some, uh, um, some ideas uh, for the questions uh, during the roundtable that could be useful also for the speakers. So uh, I go to the next slide. And now we are asking you, uh, from which country are you from? Uh, so during the registration uh, phase, we saw that uh, there were 
people coming from uh, 600 sorry 60 uh, countries uh, um, in the world so we have uh, okay you see that uh, the um, work cloud that is appearing on your screen we have a lot of people from europe italy spain france france but also people from canada mexico and uh, other continents uh, i saw that uh, nepal okay uh, is, it is what i was saying uh, we have also people from united states uh, so thanks to everybody to uh, join this event to participate in this uh, also considering uh, uh, the difference uh, in the time zone uh, so we have now uh, 200 and half people replying so we see that we have uh, we are covering all the world um, so many from Europe but uh, also from Canada um, and uh, uh, South Africa Australia and uh, thanks a lot uh, for your participation Malaysia Vietnam so um, Stefano uh, I give you the floor to, to you so we will come back again uh, when uh, uh, during the um, round table so thanks a lot for participating and uh, please uh, have uh, your smartphone with you so we will uh, uh, we will use again mentimeter thanks a lot Matteo very clear instructions and I hope you people are getting familiar with the mentimeter uh, now as Matteo said there was just some introductory questions just to break the ice uh, after that, during the roundtable, uh, we will have more dedicated questions to actually receive inputs from you, uh, because we are planning at the end of this meeting to write a short report uh, highlighting uh, what emerged from both the speakers, the roundtable participants, and of course the public. So your input is very valued, and we are really much looking forward for receiving interesting Section that will be dedicated to a round table uh, that will include the invited speaker plus uh, other additional experts that will join the panel later. Um, our first speaker, um, it is for first speaker, it's my pleasure to open the floor to Professor Ilaria Capo. Uh, Professor Capo is head of the One Health Center of Excellence for Research and Training at the University of Florida in the U.S. She's a veterinarian by training. She holds a PhD in virology and directed international reference laboratories on emerging diseases and has authored over 220 scientific publications in peer reviewed journals, uh, scientific books, and five books for the uh, general public. Uh, Professor Capo has also been a member of the Italian Parliament for over three years, from 2013 to 16. And during that period, she focused on bridging. A science to policy in the field of emerging infectious diseases and AMR. Uh, she's currently engaged in developing new frontiers for the One Health approach by exploiting the digital environment, which is the main reason why she invited her here to give us this first introductory talk. Um, as Professor Kwapo is traveling uh, at this very moment, uh, she will not deliver her speech in person, but she provided us with a video recording of her speech and she's planning to join us in person for the round table uh, in a few, uh, well, in an hour or so. So here is the speech of Professor Kappa, uh, which is about COVID-19 as accelerator of multidisciplinary research approach. Thanks a lot, even if virtually to Professor Kappa. Uh, we now have had this first introduction about the One Health dimension of the emergence, present control of COVID-19, uh, which would apply also to the And so we have work with a good role in improving global channel events. The next speaker will introduce us to the role of wildlife in emerging threats, such as this COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Lim Fa Wang. 
Professor Wang is director of the program in emerging infectious diseases at the Duke Ness uh, Medical School in Singapore. Professor Wang obtained his PhD at the University of California, Davis in the US, and then joined in 1990 the Australian Animal Health Laboratory, where he played a leading role in identifying bats as the natural hosts of the SARS virus. His research then extended from bat-borne viruses to improving understanding of virus-bat interactions, and his work has been recognized internationally through various international awards, numerous invited speeches at major international conferences, and many top scientific publications, five patents, and many invited book chapters. It is my pleasure to leave the floor to Professor Wang. I know that you might have some uh, issue with the connection. In case uh, the sound or the video won't work, we have a video, so we will back up with video. So Professor Wang, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefna. And uh, can I share my slides or? Yeah. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, great. Yeah, so thank you again, you know, for this. Uh, I'm very sim uh, sim uh, similar to Ilario that I work in animal health and now in a medical school. So we are all very one health, you know. And uh, I was talking, I was asked to talk about the role of wildlife in emerging threats, but I thought a more appropriate type, more accurate, is really the role of wildlife in emerging infectious disease threat. So I will keep it short because we have quite a few speakers tonight and have round table. So this is the outline. I will start with by trying to, you know, define what is zoonosis and what's wildlife. And uh, wildlife comes in all different forms. I'm going to focus on viruses, especially those of bad origin. Then I think it's really important, you know, in this uh, uh, zoonotic transmission, COVID-19, SARS, really to ask the question, wildlife, what's really wildlife? Because, you know, in countries like China, they have farming of wildlife. So is this now domesticated? Is it really livestock any, uh, or not wildlife anymore? And then for COVID-19, you know, I think it really a lesson that we have spear over from animal to human, then we spear back human to animal, and then can spear over again. Lastly, is something I'm very passionate about in this area of work is that if, you know, the NGS, we're really used to next generation sequencing, and it's a front line, you know, in disease investigation now. But personally, I think we need another NGS, which is the next generation serology. So, you know, the audience may know much better than I do. So zoonosis usually refer to, you know, between animal and humans, right? So mostly we're familiar with animal to human jump, but it can be reversed, you know, uh, we will come later. The interesting also is that what is a wildlife? It's very broad. There's all non-domesticated plants, animals, or other organisms. But I will come back later what domestication is. Really, you know, zoonotic diseases, zoonotic viruses is nothing new, you know. Uh, you know, it's a long history and uh, we have the high profile like HIV all the way to Zika virus and things like that. And so the, the blue box is more the old kind of well-known zoonotic virus it affects human. And on the right is a box of this more what we call emerging zoonotic viruses, you know, so we start from SARS and all the way now to SARS-2, and in between we have MERS, Hanger, Nipper, that I have worked on all of them, actually. Now, I just want to give you an example, really, civets in SARS to discuss, you know, is this a wildlife? Is this a domestic animal, right? So I was fortunate enough to work in the WHO team, you know, in uh, August 2003, so 17 years ago after the control of the pandemic of the SARS in those days, we still did not know where the virus came from. So as a part of the eight member WH team, I went to, you know, the Southern China and really eye opening. This is a farm for civets. Very, very biosecure, clean, first class. So these animals are very happy and healthy because they worth a lot of money. Now this the live animal market in Shenzhen where the animals are traded. And in the middle is this cage you see it's empty and used to be the place for trading civets. In the same market, there are over 150 live animals. And on the bottom right, quite a few animals are slaughtered, you know, near or in the market. So as you can imagine, you know, the, the line is blurred, right? Is it wildlife or is it domestic animals? And then we had the opportunity that when SARS reappeared, the mark version reappeared at the end of 2003, 
you know, the Guangdong government decided to slaughter all the civics. So we had examples coming from the green, red, the green sort of circle dots are the farms, which is supplied to the Guangzhou market, which is a square. All right, so it's all within a few hundred kilometers. But interestingly, our serology data suggests that on the farm, the green dots are absolutely clean. No antibody evidence of SARS infection. Whereas in the farm in Guangzhou, that square, 83% animals positive. So again, you know, this is a threat of wildlife or threat of domestic wildlife, you know, trading of these farmed animals. So are civets wildlife or domestic, you know, to me, it's more than just a pure scientific question. Because like, you know, in many countries, they are under very different uh, jurisdictions and the policies dealing with two groups are very different. Wildlife in China, at least, was in the Department of uh, uh, Ministry of for, uh, Forage. And if it's considered as domestic livestock and, and it's Ministry of Agriculture. And the two ministries have very different culture and I don't think they communicate very well, okay? So the same animal species can have very different exposure to pathogens and the two different scenarios. So now, fast forward 17 years later, there's a lot of debate about the origin early transmission of COVID-19. And I was thinking that, you know, 17 years ago when I was involved in the WHO team, it's much less political and the international collaboration was much better than now. But the question now is, can pangolin be the civic equivalent for COVID-19 outbreak, okay? So, you know, Irari already mentioned the previous talk about the role of pangolin. I think it's too early to really nail down to say pangolin is the animal transmitter virus to human in that market because, you know, that market, as far as we can gather, they don't trade pangolins. And so here is the phylogeny. So that, you know, on the upper right, this pink box is the, two, uh, the COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 cluster. So in the middle is all the human isolates and the red dot represents the virus now has been detected and the one isolation from civet, uh, from, sorry, from pangolin. But in comparison, the bat virus, you know, that, you know, the RG, uh, 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 the, the virus that are most closely related is from bat, is the RATG13, okay? It was sampled in a cave in Yunnan province in 2013. So related to the virus has been circulating, I think, for a long time, in bats especially. And this is a preprint just came out a few days ago, uh, last week. Uh, EcoHealth, Peter Daszak and the Malaysian scientists, now they have surveyed using retrospective sample from wildlife. These are wildlife, not farm pangolins. They find no evidence of coronavirus or other potentially zoonotic virus like hanger nipper or Ebola, you know, filoviruses, okay? But Again, in China, companies can be licensed by provincial forest departments to legally breed pangolins in captivity. So again, is this a wildlife? Is a domestic, right? So the pangolins traded on market, it could be come from farm rather than from wild. And really interesting to think of the roles of wildlife in terms of the you know, emerging ID threat, right? Mostly we think of wildlife as a natural reservoir. But as soon as the wildlife can be, you know, farmed, then it can be an intermediate host, can be an amplifier host, and then can be a spear back host, right? And then we even have the danger of some of the wildlife may not be the natural host, but become the new natural with the quotation marks. And I will illustrate that. So let's say, you know, bats are most likely the reservoir of SARS-CoV-2 and most likely in Asia, but I put a question mark because scientifically it's not 100% sure. Then the question is, do we have an intermediate animal? Is animal X? Most likely it does. I will show you later. Most of the bat bone virus, that bat to human transmission is real. And then animal X gave the virus to human. And now we know that human can spill back to animals and, you know, tigers, you know, cats, dogs, but minks, as in Netherlands, you know, is kind of right now in the news. And we know already that they can have the second spill of event from animal to human. So we just have a review right now, I think it's gonna come out, you know, uh, 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 led by EcoHealth about the potential risk of bats in North America become a spill back sort of a host. Now, 
chance is low, but if that happens, it will be disastrous because what you establish is what I classify as the new unnatural reservoir, which is a natural because it's in wildlife, but it's unnatural because it's not through natural evolution, it's through human transmission. Once that's established, then from time to time, then you have to dispute over to animal X, Y, Z, because we know that SARS-CoV-2, because they bind the AC2 receptor with high affinity, actually can infect quite a few animals. That then will trigger the next pandemic, all right? So lastly, I want to really introduce this NGS, Next Generation Serology. You know, PCR and next generation sequencing, the, the NGS most people know have been the main tools, right? Used in surveillance wildlife population up to now. But the window of detecting viral genomic sequence is narrow. You know, we all know antibody lasts much longer. So it's more sensitive in pickup infection if you want to do a population level for early warning. But serology current technology is very specific and the animal specific and the pathogen specific. So what we need is really, you know, some technological uh, evolution or revolution to get the next generation serology. So instead of interrogate, is animal X in, infected with virus X, if we can ask in the animal population what kind of infection dynamics they have over time without specified virus, really what you need is highly, highly multiplex serology. And to that regard, Steve Ellis' group, you know, has invented something called Verse Scan. I don't have the time to really go into it. Basically, it's a phage display epitope library, and the, the paper they published in Science 2015 already contained most of the known virus that infect humans. So the whole library, basically, you use a drop of blood, you can interrogate antibodies against all known human virus. So that's one end of the sort of next generation serology. The other end of what I have been working on with SARS coronavirus 2 is we want species independent serology. For example, just use SARS CoV 2, we already know there are many animals that are susceptible. So, what we need is a, a one serology for different animals. But we still want this to be highly specific, and easy to use, and can be used for different animal species in the same test. So, we uh, invented something called a surrogate uh, virus neutralization and SBNT. So it's the diagram on the left, as you can see, in a classical virus neutralization, the virus will bind to something like in SARS, COVID-2 or SARS, it binds to the AC2 receptor on the membrane surface. In the presence of neutralizing antibodies, majority of the neutralizing antibody were targeted to the receptor binding domain and block that, and so we say the virus is neutralized. And then what we did is that, you know, in the surrogate virus neutralization, we did a protein engineering. So we expressed the receptor AC2 as a soluble protein and a coated on the ELISA plate. And, uh, and then the virus spike protein, we only engineered and expressed the RBD, receptor binding domain. And we made the life even easier by chemically conjugate with the host retroprotein. So now it's basically ELISA, RBD, AC2 binding, you have a color in the presence of neutralizing antibody on the right side, and then you block that protein-protein interaction and get the inhibition. So here are very quickly the data. In panel C, what we have is COVID-19, so the demonstrated binding. So in the grain is the nucleic acid protein, which is not supposed to bind the ACE2. Blue is the S1 protein, and the red is RBD. So RBD was the best, you know, the receptor binding domain is exposed and it binds to ACE2. In panel D is we use uh, COVID-19 patient zero, one or two, red and blue. You have a dose-dependent inhibition, and two negative healthy controls has no uh, inhibition or neutralization activity. To demonstrate a species independent, you know, so also because the ACE2 is used by SARS and COVID-19, so we now have surrogate virus neutralization for both COVID-19 and SARS virus. For COVID-19, we had a immunized animals, we don't have infected. So rabbit zero and the uh, mouse zero, as you can see, build for uh, neutralization inhibition. On the right is SARS. So, you know, before I came to Singapore, I was in Australia. So we had a live ferret and the rabbit uh, infected with the virus. And as you can see, whether it's infected or immunized, whether it's ferrets, rabbits, or mice, it all works very well good in this surrogate virus neutralization. So as I said, you know, we know already that Cats, dogs, tigers, and minks are the sort of uh, infected by spillback. And the bats, pangolins, and most like civets were, can be infected in 
natural nature and it's highly susceptible. Okay, so this is just you know my kind of personal life in a quarter of a century. I have been working on emerging zoonotic virus of bat origins so from Hydra, Nipah, SARS, MERS, Ebola, and to COVID-19. Although, as I said, the intermediate host is not well defined yet for COVID-19, but I think you know it's a matter of time. And also, I think COVID-19 will not be the last virus to emerge from bats if we don't change the way we you know live, we farm, and we trade. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot to Professor Wang for this very interesting speech. Your speech to be in a webinar and not be allowed to clapping. Uh, happy you have received this explanation about the role of wild farm animals in species and for the production of next generation serology. Um, it is, I wanted to say, a great pleasure to see that many of you attended this meeting. We are nearly 430 people. Um, stay with us. We have the opportunity of discussing further the role of wildlife in the emergence of the um, so to improve our Thank you, Stefano. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, so I will uh, share the slides. So I would like first to thank the organizers for inviting me to present uh, some aspects of the ZP project. So I'm currently working for industry at the Beringer in Galheim Animal Health, and I'm, I am the coordinator of this ZEPI Innovative Medicines Initiative project, which has been actually the first One Health project in this private-public partnership at the European level. <clears throat> and the objective of ZEPI was to address uh, from an industrial perspective, how to uh, develop tools or intervention tools against infectious diseases and outbreaks, especially zoonotic diseases, but it will apply, of course, to any uh, infectious disease that spread rapidly around the globe. And that's why the title is the ZEPI Modular Vaccine Design Approach as a potential answer to pandemics and panzootic threats. So when we face pandemics or panzootics, because it's the same nature of, of issue, we know and we all know, as uh, Ilaria and uh, Linfa described previously, that we cannot really predict where exactly and to which target species an emerging or emerging virus will trigger the next pandemic or next panzootic event. And actually, all outbreaks for humans and uh, veterinary species in the past 20 years, and we have seen the list uh, just before, SARS, Ebola, MERS, uh, flu, West Nile, Blue Tongue in Europe, Schmalenberg also in Europe, have 
occurred fully unexpectedly and as a complete surprises regarding time and location. I don't think we can really predict what will happen next in terms of um, nature of virus and, and species. But today we, we know and we have very good guesses on the most likely suspects and we can distribute it between the viruses, many RNA viruses actually, which can be transmitted by contact or air transmission, so paramyxo, automyxo, coronaviruses, as we do see today, and the insect-borne viruses, which are also spreading due to climate changes, and that includes bunya viruses, orbiviruses, flaviviruses. And for these viruses, we know very well uh, the structure and the, the family, and that is why we have developed uh, the ZEPI approach to express some key subunits to, in order to develop vaccines that can be manufactured at a very large scale. And in, in fact, the only way to face these unexpected viral outbreaks is to develop our capacity to execute an immediate and decisive intervention. As we cannot predict, we cannot stockpile for hundreds of different vaccines. The other way around is really to be very, very fast in action uh, and uh, preparation, manufacturing vaccines, diagnostics, and so on. But this strategy, of course, raises a big dilemma for uh, the industry. Manufacturing human and veterinary vaccines is the same in terms of scale. It's really how you can uh, make or you can render compatibil compatibility between a very fast action and at the same time not chasing all false alerts because most of the uh, outbreaks can self-resolve and it will take a few weeks or sometimes months to understand if it's really a global uh, issue or not. And in industry, uh, meaning uh, <clears throat> reacting very fast means to avoid also or to in start investing huge levels of resources with high risk to fail um, after a few months. At the same time, and something which is also um, <clears throat> very clear now, and, and people don't really appreciate in the public and even in, uh, in the expert uh, world, is how to address exponential needs while your manufacturing capacity increase can only be in low arithmetic because at manufacturing plant, you can only increase the capacity by two or three times when you are using uh, classical technologies. So in, even for veterinary vaccines, which have lower requirements, developing new vaccines is a very long process due to the ethical need to validate the safety, of course, the efficacy and the development process because that's maybe the longest part and typically it is based on years of work. And in this way to develop and register a vaccine, you have three different time periods to consider. The first is the scientific time where you understand the disease, the virus and the target in terms of uh, key immunogens. Then you have a technical and industrial time, so the development and the process for manufacturing at very large scale. And of course, the last one is regulatory and registration time. And the question for us is, is it possible to decrease these three uh, timelines to be an effective against outbreaks that spread around the world in a few months, uh, as we have seen uh, for SARS-CoV-2? And today, we don't, the, the different timelines are not matching, of course. So ZEPI, was in fact focused on the idea to shorten timelines, not on the scientific time, because today it's faster and faster with uh, next gen sequencing and other tools we have to identify um, the right immunogen for a given uh, viral family, but especially focusing on the technical and industrial time uh, regarding the capability and the capacity and this is why the ZEPI core objective has, to be, has, has been to develop a vaccine by design approach. And I will describe in the next few slides. And for regulatory and registration time, of course, reducing that uh, is a collective effort, even a societal effort, because you need to change the requirements which have been put in place to 
ensure safety for the recipients of the vaccines and for the environment. And you need to revisit that in order to be much uh, faster. So this needs uh, and will need in the future a societal and technical adaptation. And also you need to change your mindset. We need to move in a term of uh, crisis or so health crisis. You need to move from a risk to benefit balance to a benefit to risk balance. So it's, this is easier, of course, to achieve for veterinary vaccines than for human vaccines. But in the long term and depending on the mortality rate of a new disease, uh, this has to be uh, considered. So in terms of ZP pandemics vaccines, the key drivers for us uh, have been in the design in such a way that you can achieve what we call a surge capacity manufacturing approach. Uh, so the manufacturing has to be based on a flexible platform, which will fit with most of the potential viral vaccine targets. Difficult to say 100%, but we want to cover at least 90%. We need, of course, to use a lean and sustainable manufacturing platform, so something you can recycle for any new target, so decreasing and reducing the effort from a financial perspective, but also from a staff perspective. It has to be simple and a portable technology that can be available worldwide, because the more you multiply the centers of manufacturing, the more capacity you have. Uh, you need also to ensure that at least for the manufacturing of raw materials and key ingredients, you don't want to see and, and face bottlenecks. Uh, and today we, we see the announcements of uh, <clears throat> many, uh, companies saying they can provide uh, hundreds of millions or billions of doses. This is not realistic uh, when you go uh, to the ground. And in order also to be very good at delivering the search capacity, you need to have a process with a very rapid cycle time, including a full in vitro quality control. This is key. On top of that, of course, you can hope to have a thermostable vaccine for an easy distribution and enabling also a supply chain in low and middle income countries, but not only. And to do that, ZP project has been, in fact, a demonstrator at the industrial level using three zo different zoonotic viral prototypes for which we knew that vaccines are uh, effective, but we have revisited these vaccines. And, and the three models are Rift Valley Fever, Schmallenberg virus, and the MERS coronavirus, which is a beta coronavirus. And for these uh, three targets, we have been able to identify discrete uh, immunogenic and protective subunit domains for each of them using in silico tools uh, quite easily, relatively uh, small subunits that are the base for the large scale manufacturing for the next steps. So it was amazing for us to, to achieve such a, a good results very fast, and we have validated the three targets directly in target species and over animal models. <clears throat> and the other part of the platform is uh, it is this modular scaffold that we have used, combining with a, a very innovative technology, with, which is bacterial superglue. So the idea and the concept is to use um, what we call a multimeric protein scaffold uh, particle, NPSP which comes from uh, the nature, from different uh, thermophilic bacteria. These particles are auto-assembling very uh, nicely. They are expressed at high level in E. coli or other systems. And we fuse them with a part of the superglue, which is a spy tag, combining with the other counterpart moiety, which is spy catcher, which is fused to the target uh, immunogen that we are using. This is expressed either in baculo or in a fungus, the C1 system from dialic. And then the trick is really just to mix the two components and they will auto-assemble uh, at room temperature by simple mixing. So it's really like uh, a ligase for DNA. It's like playing Lego uh, with proteins. So that's, in fact, 
it's for me a dream coming true because I was dreaming of Legos when I was a young kid and now I can do that with, uh, with vaccines. So it's really remarkable and that's uh, also a key element in the way uh, for large scale manufacturing. And we have validated this, this approach with in the three different uh, models using the NPSP complex vaccine candidates for RIFT, uh, that was in a sh challenge in SHIP, performed by our partner in the Lelystat, WBVR. Uh, we compared the, one, the same subunit uh, from GN uh, glycoprotein coupled to three different MPSP. So diff three different MPSP complexes were tested in parallel and we could observe that all of them was provided, were providing full protection against uh, the challenge in ship and the paper will come out this year by uh, Paul Wischgers, Schreer and collaborators. The second model is the Schmalenberg uh, G6 unit coupled to another, one of the particles that we have used for Rift and this one was validated by challenge also in cattle at uh, FLI. Uh, in Germany. A paper also will come soon from Andrea Ebischer. Very, very good success. Each time we have a, a complete sterile immunity and of course using a, a small subunit um, is opening the way for a DIVA approach uh, when needed. And the last model, sorry, is the one related to the MERS coronavirus, which is a beta coronavirus relatively close to, the, to SARS and SARS-CoV-1. COV <clears throat> the RBD, so receptor binding domain in this case, was coupled to the lumazine synthase, another particle, and validated in a rabbit uh, challenge model. We also validated the subunit alone in a LIAMA model in, in Spain. And in this case, we have demonstrated, as you can see, a very good level of protection against the viral load after immunization. And actually, the comparison between the coupled subunit and the MPSP compared to the uncoupled mixture, so the RBD subunit mixed with the lumazine synthase but not coupled, we, dec we increase the level of immunogenicity doing that. So a particle display is also a key element of the ZAPI approach. So how to use that for shortening timelines and delivering vaccines uh, to the field? So the first timeline to be reduced is the scientific timeline, as I said, and today, we, as soon as you have identified clinical cases in the field, you can get a very good idea of um, what it is just a few days, and we have seen with SARS-CoV-2 that just a few days after the official announcement uh, in Wuhan, uh, the sequence was available to everyone in the world, and you can start working. So you can screen and, and develop and define the subunit that you will use for making the vaccine. This is also combined with the global knowledge we have today on most suspected viral families. and. Of course, speaking general on a global scale and one else approach, we can learn and we have learned a lot from veterinary vaccines. So we have a good confidence in what to use for the next one to come. A potential bottleneck that can remain is really the establishment of a pertinent animal model. The timelines can be uncertain uh, in some cases. For the key part, which is the technical industrial timeline, uh, the reduction in, uh, in time will come from the use of a robust expression platform with very high yields and short cycle time. And that's something we have developed within ZAPI by um, developing the Fungus C1 system with Dyadic. And we can get today um, on yields of grams per liter for an antigen, which is really, really large and enable millions of doses under a reduced volume, which is quite important. Because if you are using small volumes, let's say 100 liters to deliver several millions of doses, you have a limited impact on the manufacturing plant footprint and also on the other vaccines in production. So you don't have to shut down everything else in the, in the plant. 
<clears throat> and you can deliver with a very short cycle time quite a large number of doses in a few months. Also, because it's a simple technology, you don't need highly specialized sites and technical staff to run the manufacturing. And the last time uh, is, of course, you need to decrease the regulatory timeline. And in the future, this should be based on the quality by design approach and the use of an established platform. Because you will build, you will build trust for regulatory uh, bodies by providing first a, a vaccine final product which is inherently safe, for the, both for target species and the environment. So in this case, we are not using, a, we don't deliver a GMO, a live GMO, it's just inert uh, proteins. If you have a very consistent and robust manufacturing process, it means that you deliver on a constant basis, always the same product. If you are using simple system based on, on synthetic culture media, there is, and ferment, based on just on fermentation, bacteria or fungus, you don't have any risk for viral contaminants. And because your vaccine is, is a very well described object, you can describe it by just biophysical criteria and enabling a very fast um, QC release for the, the batches. And thanks to uh, ZAPI, we have a regulatory uh, work package which has discussed a lot with regulatory authorities. And we put the, the, today the platform master file concept has been uh, uh, written in the future EMA guidelines for the veterinary uh, medical product. And this concept allows now an accelerated licensing procedure. The same is in, in the process for human products has been published. And we think that also the new, there could be a new fast track process based on the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines learning because today everyone is, is really racing to put a vaccine on the, not on the market, but in the field as soon as possible. And you have to, to change the rules. <clears throat> so using a new platform, of course, is not a way to, to have an established platform, but because of the na very nature of the final product, we think that we can deliver now in a few months a um, very large number of doses in order to react against most of the potential emerging viruses. And so I would like to thank you for your attention. All the ZAPI partners, so there are 20 uh, partners involved in, uh, in the ZAPI project, and the work is really done by, by them. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Odene. I hope you can hear me. I heard that you had problems in, in hearing me earlier and trying to fix it. I hope yes. you manage. I'm not no, sure. No, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Okay. I hope it will stay okay. Um, yeah, before, so, I'm sorry because before I couldn't hear your introduction. <laughs> oh, so very sorry for that. I'm trying to fix it in the uh, back line with the others. So I hope it will be better starting now. Um, so thanks a lot for this very clear introduction about the ZAPI project activities. And uh, now we've been uh, introduced some of the things that are needed in peacetime to improve preparedness to new pandemics. But what can you do to predict the next pandemic? Well, the next talk that will be provided by Professor Mark Woolhouse will cover this area. Uh, Professor Woolhouse is Chair of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at the Asher Institute, University of Edinburgh in the UK. Uh, Professor Woolhouse holds a bachelor's degree in zoology from the University of Oxford, as well as a master of science degree in biological computation, a PhD in biology. Uh, he is also a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and of the Academy of Medical Sciences. And he was appointed as a member of the Order of the British Empire in 2002 um, for services to the control of infectious diseases. So Professor Woolhouse, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. Very well. Good. Thank you. So how close are we to being able to predict the next pandemic 
and my answer to that question is actually I think we're probably quite a lot closer than we currently realize. I've been in this business a long time, not quite as long as Lin Farr, but my group started working on these problems over 20 years ago. And we began with two very simple observations that three quarters of what were then defined as emerging infectious diseases were in fact RNA viruses and that three quarters of emerging infectious diseases had zoonotic origins. And that's a very well-known pair of observations now, but 20 years ago, it wasn't so clear that that was the case. And, and so uh, ourselves and others were some of the first to, to make that part of that very simple prediction that RNA viruses of zoonotic origin were a particular threat uh, very clear. And over that 20 years, there's been many, many people in my group and beyond who've contributed to this work. I've just highlighted a few names here that have contributed to the projects I'll describe now. So I said we were, we were closer than we thought, and this is part of my evidence for this. Uh, many of you will know the World Health Organization's R&D blueprint exercise, where the World Health Organization made a, a formal Try to, try to introduce a formal methodology for identifying what the epidemic threats currently were, and, and particularly they had another dimension to this, those that needed further R&D investment. So for example, they weren't thinking of obvious things like pandemic influenza or, or HIV, but the, the less well-known potential pandemic threats. Now, this committee first met in 2016 and they have a rotating membership. I was a member of it in 2017. And in 2017, we produced a list of uh, infections, which was then picked up in 2018. I'm going to talk about the 2018 committee, because I think they were the cleverest of all three. And they identified this list of disease priorities, where you can see there are uh, eight uh, uh, roughly eight different viruses. They're all RNA viruses. Um, they're all uh, of zoonotic origin. And they also have an extra category, disease X. Now, disease X was something that we entered the 2017 committee. And this is the first time, to my knowledge, that the term was used. And disease X was there because the viruses preceding it on that list were already known. Of course, these were existing known threats. And we wanted to highlight the possibility that a serious international epidemic could be caused by a pathogen currently unknown to, to cause human disease. The 2018 committee were cleverer uh, because they dug a bit deeper into potential disease X. They highlighted quite a few, so this wasn't a standout recommendation. But one of the ones they highlighted was highly pathogenic coronal virus diseases other than MERS and SARS. And I don't think you can get too much closer to that. I've done a little bit of digging since then, and I can't see that the recommendations of the 2018 committee led to any immediate increased research investment in uh, particular coronaviruses, but other ones on that list. Um, but clearly it could have and perhaps should have. Okay, how do these emergencies of the new viruses happen? Well, we've taken a phylogenetic approach to this in my group in the last few years. And what we attempted was a phylogenetic survey of all emerging, uh, emerged human viruses. So we selected from the vast amount of sequence data that are out there uh, using a carefully prescribed protocol, 1,755 sequences from 39 different RNA virus genera. And we were interested in two traits about them. One was, we call this levels, but very simply, level one is an animal virus, doesn't infect humans. Level two is a strictly zoonotic virus. And level three or four are viruses that can not only infect humans, but they can also be transmitted by humans. We need to be careful with that because the transmission may not be direct, it may be indirect via a vector or some other route. But nonetheless, a human can be infectious, uh, and therefore the virus can spread through human populations. We concentrated, because this has become apparent, that 
all human viruses are closely related to mammal or bird viruses, but not other kinds. That seems to be a fairly robust rule. And we, we looked at the, the phylogenetic origins of the human viruses in all those 39 genera. And what we concluded, and that's in the box there, is the majority, the great majority of new human viruses with epidemic potential, so the ones that are transmissible, are related to, but not directly descended from other viruses that are transmissible in human populations. And that's actually, in evolutionary terms, a fairly rare thing to happen. We only identified 57 human transmissible RNA virus lineages. So over the entire history of humanity and the entire history of these RNA virus genera, this has only happened 57 times that a new transmissible lineage has become apparent. As an interesting aside, I've been talking, as I said, on this topic for many years, and I've always made the point that evolving uh, new human uh, transmissible lineages is, is quite a difficult thing to do. It doesn't happen that often. Uh, what, what I'd also said at the same time was, however, strictly zoonotic viruses are appearing all the time. It's quite easy to infect humans, but it's harder for viruses to become transmissible within humans. That turns out not to be true at all. The, in, the lineages which are purely infected, purely strictly zoonotic, are just as restricted as the human transmissible ones. So viruses don't evolve to infect humans all that often, um, but 57 is still a larger number than we would like. And the beta coronaviruses, which of course are particularly interesting, illustrate that model perfectly. Um, they, uh, as um, any phylogeny will show you, they have a number of uh, lineages in there, and basically there are two kinds, ones which are animal viruses and ones which are transmissible in humans. We don't know any strictly zoonotic beta coronaviruses, and that's in marked contrast to other major genera like lysovirus, like orthohantavirus, that are almost exclusively the human viruses within those are strictly zoonotic or very, very poorly transmitting. So there's a marked difference. This transmissibility trait seems uh, critical here. The other couple of points I'd like to make while I'm on talking about beta coronavirus genus is that we had, as we all know, SARS-1 in 2003, and we've had SARS coronavirus 2 in 2019-2020. Now, the statistics of rare events is difficult, and before I would have said that from all these range of viruses, anywhere where you saw human transmissible viruses might be the root of the next one, but to have two events like that in very short succession makes me an awful lot more worried about SARS-3 uh, than I was six months ago. So uh, I think that's something we do have to pay attention to. And it may not just not be the beta coronaviruses. Uh, the alpha coronaviruses uh, also emerge. Uh, NL63, as many of you will know, is an alpha coronavirus. It uses the same receptor as the SARS coronaviruses, the ACE2 receptor. And its entry into the human populations is actually dated uh, in the early part of the 20th century. So that may be a fairly recent acquisition uh, to, to the human virus repertoire as well. So I, I think we do have to pay particular attention to this, uh, the alpha, alpha coronaviruses and the beta coronaviruses. OK, what about where? Well, we've uh, done quite a bit of statistical modeling on where viruses are discovered. Um, and this particular topic has uh, a long uh, history where people have published some very interesting papers on hotspots of viral emergence. The difficulty with all those studies is it's very, very hard to separate the, the natural history of the viruses, where they occur, where they enter human populations, from the enormously variable effort in trying to discover or detect those viruses. Uh, and that's been a real problem for the field. And we, we took a novel solution to that problem. We decided to ignore it completely. And so we just looked at the locations around the world where new viruses had been discovered. And we used it an artificial intelligence kind of approach, a boosted regression tree model with a whole range of predictors uh, socioeconomic ones, land use ones, climate ones, and biodiversity ones. We trained the model on all virus discoveries worldwide, and we also did a submodel. This is last year we did this for the viruses when they were discovered in China specifically. And 
what we found was the, the top predictors uh, for where new viruses are likely to be discovered is actually GDP and GDP growth. It's a socioeconomic variable. It's about uh, an advanced economy or a rapidly growing economy. That's where we find them. Um, the next one, and that presumably is at least in part a measure of the effort we put into discovering them. Uh, urbanization is also critical and those somewhat more important than climate or biodiversity, which have previously been identified. And the model works reasonably well. Um, on the top part, the top map, the world map, you can see some black triangles, and those are where the viruses discovered uh, since we trained the model up to 2015 have been located, and they fit very nicely uh, within our hotspot zones. And on the China one, you can see the same thing, where viruses have been discovered for the first time in China, mostly but not exclusively uh, within our hotspot zones. The big white arrow, of course, is Wuhan, uh, which uh, came along after we did this work. Wuhan is basically right on the edge of one of our hot zones, so it's not a it's not an unlikely place to find a novel virus. So, uh, but as you can see, the hot spots are quite limited parts of the of the surface of the world. So it does help you somewhat in narrowing down where you expect new viruses to be discovered. Why this one? Well, it's been mentioned by several uh, speakers already that one of the potential reservoirs for SARS coronavirus 2 is the greater horseshoe bat, or certainly some kind of horseshoe bat. And I think there's some interesting observations to be made just by looking at the natural history, good old natural history of these. Um, what do these bats do? Well, They do not predict in most case. The animals are very densely packed. Um, we've highlighted the greater horseshoe bat because it's the only one we could find whose range actually includes Wuhan, which is what's shown on that map. But there are, of course, other horseshoe bat species as well. But the other thing about these bats is they're loud. They use echolocation to get about. Um, and of course, echolocation uh, involves releasing aerosols. It has to, to some degree. And of course, this is how SARS coronavirus is transmitted. We've known that for some time. And we've known that it's transmitted particularly well indoors, in poorly ventilated and perhaps cool places away from the sunlight. And perhaps no surprise that there is quite a number of papers now identifying SARS coronavirus 2 outbreaks with religious centers and choirs, particularly. So lots of humans together in a large, cool, damp dampish space, uh, singing very loudly seems to be a good way of transmitting this virus. Now, I don't know how we go about proving this hypothesis, um, but I think it's certainly intriguing, just what you might learn from looking at the natural history. So to conclude, how close are we to be able to predict the next pandemic? I, I think, as I said, much closer than perhaps we realize. You know, the World Health Organization 2018 R&D Blueprint Committee came awfully close uh, to predicting this kind of event which we're now going through. Um, emergence, well, RNA viruses dominate, but of course there is a longer list of things we might be worried about. But the key trait here is transmissibility, the viruses that do or don't evolve to be transmissible in humans. Uh, we know they're most likely from other mammals or birds. We've known that for a long time. And uh, the prioritization, well, I've talked about disease X, um, but it's also another range, uh, another set of viruses that are already known to be transmissible, which all the ones on the WHO preprint list are. And in fact, there's a, a larger number of that. But that is a good trait for predicting outcomes. A few years ago, we published a paper in the journal Emerging Infectious Diseases uh, highlighting that Ebola, chikungunya, and Zika virus were all ones where had this trait, and we might expect more major outbreaks, full-scale epidemics, than we'd had before. And of course, that's exactly what happened. All three of those did emerge. So it's not just disease X. The, the known ones with transmission potential are significant. And the response to this, well, I think we're going to come on to this in the group discussion, but rapid detection and monitoring is absolutely key uh, to responding to the emergence of a, a new virus, whether we predicted it or not. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Woolhouse, for this very interesting talk.
We are running a little bit behind schedule. I hope you can hear me well. Um, so it's now time to discuss what is the role of research uh, in improving the control of infectious diseases. So I'm happy to introduce our last speaker for the first section. Last but not least, I would like to say, is Dr. Alex Morrow uh, that will talk us about the Stylus IRC, um, efforts toward improving the focus of research uh, to deliver the necessary disease control tools. Uh, Dr. Morrow is International Evidence Lead for Animal Health and Welfare at DEFRA UK. A vet by training. He has been actively involved in research for many years before joining DEFRA, where he has been working in research program management for about 17 years. In 2005, he established and coordinated for 10 years the European Collaborative Working Group on Animal Health and Welfare Research um, and uh, launched in 2011 the Staridas Global Network, which he managed until 2015. Then he oversaw the formation of the Associated International Research Consortium, and now is chair of its EU-funded secretariat. So, Dr. Morrow, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Stefano. Um, can I have my presentation, please? Yep. Dr. Morrow, you can use uh, the panel on your left. You see an arrow below the number. If you click on it, you can uh, move the slide. I, I, I don't actually have the slides on the screen. See your slide? Can you see? Them? Yeah, I, I see my slide now. So the arrow is to the left hand side, but I don't see it. Okay. Okay. Sorry. If you want, I can move your the slide for you. Uh, yeah, could you go to the next slide, please? Yep. Just a second. Okay, this is a picture that I took of a poster at the entrance to an exhibition in the Smithsonian Natural History Museum uh, in Washington, marking the centenary of the 1918 flu pandemic, which Alaria mentioned earlier on. Um, outbreak, epidemics in a connected world. And then the subtitle, Our World is Interconnected More Than Ever Before, by global travel and trade, technology, and even our viruses. So it's the need for a joined up approach to technology development to counteract these threats that I want to focus on. So I'll describe briefly what we are doing in Staridus International Research Consortium to speed up the development uh, of new control tools. Could I have the next slide, please? So Staridus International Research Consortium is a global initiative um, to improve the coordination of research activities on the major infectious disease of livestock and zoonosis, so as to speed up the development of improved control methods. The partners have agreed to um, they've agreed delivery targets, which include vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics, um, and key pieces of information um, needed for disease control. Partners have also agreed, where possible, to coordinate or align their funding to deliver these targets, and they've agreed to share research results, of course, bearing in mind the need to protect intellectual property. Um, currently, there are 28 partners from 18 countries involved. Um, it's about coordination at the level of the research uh, funder or program owner. So, as well as national funding bodies uh, and program owners, the partners also include the European Commission, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, and some industry partners. The total combined five-year um, research budget of the, those 28 partners for research in this area is in the region of about 2.5 billion US dollars. The, the 28 partners that are mentioned uh, come from the country shown in, in dark blue or navy. Uh, the light blue um, is the widest in our IDIS, um, community. Uh, the people who are involved in the original uh, star riders who haven't signed up to the higher level of commitment under uh, the International Research Consortium. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide shows the operational structure of the IRC uh, with the partners forming the International um, the 
Research Consortium Executive Committee in the top box. And it's advised by a scientific 16 person scientific committee. And working groups are formed for priority topics to conduct research gap analysis and develop research roadmaps for the development of vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics, disease control strategies. Most of the priority topics um, are specific diseases and include those conditions caused by coronaviruses. Remember, we've got some very important ones on the veterinary side, such as infectious bronchitis or poultry, or porcine epidemic diarrhea, which caused uh, huge losses in the US a few years ago. However, some of the working groups um, are focusing on cross-cutting issues such as black vaccine platform development and new technologies that might be useful for disease detection and diagnosis, and the importance of uh, platform technologies for uh, vaccines and um, diagnosis uh, has been mentioned already. Uh, this structure is underpinned by a secretariat um, that is funded by the European Commission, and I lead that secretariat, uh, but it also involves the World Organization for Animal Health, OIE, um, UK Research and Innovation, BBSRC, uh, CABI, which are knowledge managers in the field of agriculture, and Animal Health Europe. Go to the next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. Sorry, uh, go back one. Um, so to speed up the innovation pipeline from basic science through to the required products, be it vaccines, therapeutics, or whatever, um, it's important to work together internationally and along the research pipeline, focusing resources on critical research gaps uh, where it's most needed. Yeah, next slide, please. Um, research roadmaps are being developed uh, for vaccine development, diagnostics, therapeutics, and the disease con um, control strategies for various diseases uh, shown earlier. So mapping out the research needs from basic science through to uh, the target product, be it a candidate vaccine or whatever. So what we've got here is basically the generic um, vaccine research roadmap. Uh, not every box uh, or node will apply in each uh, case, but some of the key steps in, um, are included, such as identity of protective antigens, host response to natural infection, identity of immunomodulators from the pathogen, identity of, of vir virulence factors. Those are key uh, issues, um, and they're captured in um, that generic roadmap. It's, of course, really important to identify early on what the target product profile is. What are we wanting to develop? Could I have the next slide, please? And this rather anemic slide is what the, um, the roadmap looks like on our website. Um, so behind each um, applicable node or lead, um, there's the lead summary covering uh, the research question. What are we trying to achieve and why? What is the problem we're trying to solve? Uh, details of the challenges to address that question. Possible solution routes. Dependencies, usually more basic science. Um, state of the art, some of the key pieces of knowledge that we already know relating to that challenge. And, and then we hope to map the current research um, projects that are going on that are addressing uh, those challenges. Uh, this will, of course, allow funders and researchers to see where investment is needed uh, and the research community um, the pathway to impact uh, for their next grant uh, application. Some new generic roadmaps have been developed for diagnostics, therapeutics, disease control strategies, and we're working with uh, the, mem the research community through the working groups in developing these lead summaries for the various priority topics. And can I have the next slide, please? So I'll leave it at that, and uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot, Alex, for a very clear presentation. Uh, there is indeed much that coordination in research could do to improve disease control, and the Slides ISC could be the ideal platform to provide this. 
Uh, so we have now reached the end of the first part of our webinar. And before starting with the round table, I would like again to, talk, to thank all speakers for their invaluable contribution. Uh, this event sure wouldn't, wouldn't have been possible without you. And I will also take the opportunity to thank the uh, scientific coordinator of this meeting, Marina Bagni from the Italian Ministry of Health, as well as the other members of the scientific committee who put together this meeting. Um, even though you will not be able to see all of them, they put a lot of effort in the organization of this event and deserve a big thank you. So I would like to mention Hein Imbrecht, Alex Morrow, Hermann Schobersberger, and Johannes Schalier. Um, of course, it is now time to start with the round table and to get into the details of what we started discussing in the first part of our webinar earlier on today. The round table will be divided in five main sessions. They will follow a similar uh, framework of what we did for the talks we had earlier. We will start looking into the One Health dimension of diseases to then start discussing about the role of biosecurity for the control of diseases, the activity to improve preparedness, the development of new control tools, and how to improve research management on animal health or the interface between animal and human health. The roundtable will see the participation of some additional speakers, in addition to the invited ones you already met in the first part of the meeting. And it's now my pleasure to briefly introduce you uh, these new speakers. You'll see them on the screen. We will have Dr. Arja Stegeman, a uh, full professor of farm animal health and epidemiology of infectious diseases at the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Uh, Jan Schatzkavit, a research policy officer at the unit Research and Innovation at DG Agri at the European Commission. Hein Imbrex, which is the coordinator of the One Health AGP and chair of this collaborative working group on animal health and welfare research, and Luc O'Neill, which is, who is professor of biochemistry in the School of Bio Biochemistry and Immunology at the Trinity College of Dublin, and founding director at the Trinity College. So um, the first session will be, uh, well, I, I would kindly remind all the speakers to limit their replies to a maximum of two three minutes in order to allow us to stay in track with our time management. We are running behind schedule, so please uh, keep time. And I would also like to remind all of the participants that they will have access to Mentimeter. During the round table, you will see on the screen the questions you will be allowed to reply, and you will see a visualization of the answer we'll be receiving uh, that will be progress uh, during the presentation. Um, so let's start with the One Health section. So we discussed about the One Health approach, which is a cross-sectoral collaboration between uh, parts in the field of animal health, public health, and the environment. And how can a One Health approach improve the preparedness of key actors against upcoming outbreaks? I would like to ask the first question under this session to uh, Professor Ilaria Capua that should have joined us. Uh, we're not sure if her connection will allow us to participate in person. If it's not the case, we have a, a reply which is registered. So, um, so Professor Capo, given the importance of a multidisciplinary approach, uh, which are the main obstacles to reaching a real One Health organization in the research field? According to your professional experience around the world, have you found differences on these aspects? Thanks a lot to Professor Capo for this reply. I would like to ask a second question to uh, Dr. Imbrecht. Uh, Dr. Imbrecht, you are the scientific coordinator of the One Health AGP, which is a five years project under the Horizon 2020 uh, program of the European Commission, which started in January 2018. How can this project contribute to more, more successfully implementing a One Health approach through Europe? How can it help in improving the preparedness of key actors against upcoming outbreaks? Or is yours, Dr. Imbrick? Do you hear me now? Yes, we do. Hello. Yes, we yes. can hear you. Yes. Okay, so the one yeah, the one health EGP is a project. It's uh, under Horizon 2020, a uh, five years project, uh, which is now its mid terms, and it has uh, 38 organizations from 19 uh, countries. Now, um, these are all public institutions that are involved in animal health, public health, food safety, and they have reference tasks. And reference tasks 
uh, for the authorities and they are also involved in risk assessment. And they have these mandates from the authorities that may be the, the public health, maybe agriculture, um, local food agencies, and there is a close collaboration with, with um, ECDC, EFSA, and now we have also other uh, stakeholders on board also like FAO and like WHO. So um, you need for, in order to be successful in One Health, you need these good contacts and you need this uh, support and broad interest so that you can uh, gain um, interest and, and gain uh, impact. So um, as for the um, DGP, this is a project which is only a project, but on the other hand, it is also an opportunity for official laboratories, for ministries, so Ministries of Public Health and Agricultural Research, um, to evaluate and, and to amend, uh, if needed, the existing uh, surveillance programs that are uh, in particular those that, uh, that are dealing with animal health and with uh, public health and the collaboration. So, for instance, everything going, the, lab, the laboratory technologies for detection or for uh, characterization of pathogens, the, the organization methodologies to, to, uh, um, to discuss and to, to collaborate between uh, partners across the different uh, sectors, across different agencies maybe. Um, databases that are owned to both sides have to talk to each other, that data have to, to share and so on. So these, um, these elements are all used and discussed within this One Health EGP. Um, uh, we, and in, in this project, we, we um, provide instruments and, and we, we encourage uh, this, this specific um, uh, cross-sector uh, collaboration. We by by organizing uh, research, so there is research done in, in these uh, 38 um, uh, partners, which is important to, to be in contact, stay in contact, to improve uh, the contacts between these uh, sectors. And we uh, this research is all done based on a research agenda, which has been developed by the authorities and also by EFSA ECDC, for instance, that helped us in creating this prior, identifying this uh, priorities and building this uh, agenda. And so the final objective of a project as ours in Europe is to create this, uh, this stronger uh, field of collaboration and so to promote the preparedness of these official laboratories, these public laboratories that are involved in animal health and in public health. Now, I should also ask two other aspects. It is not only creating this, this um, collaboration and, and um, and, um, and building trust, I would say, what also is important is that these outcomes that are coming, that deliverables that come out of the, the project, that they should be also uh, fed to and, and, and given to, sent to uh, those stakeholders that can use them the most. So that may be the reference laboratories, that may be uh, the authorities, that may be uh, at European level, um, the, the, the commission and so on. So it is very important to, to have to create a process uh, that feedbacks the outcomes to the um, those stakeholders that need these outcomes the best. And so science to policy is very important as well as a good communication service, a good communication tool that helps in this uh, in creating this objective. And also it is important to have this uh, idea of how can we take initiatives now that for sure will be will not only stop at the end of uh, will that so the um, deliverable that will not stop at the end of the project but that go on later on and so this is uh, very important the sustainability the long term uh, impact of a project like this uh, that that are cross uh, sector cross ministry cross um, agency maybe and to have an impact and to be better prepared in the future. So this is a, a pilot study, I would say. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Hank, for your very interesting points. And I would have, I would like to ask the last question to uh, Professor O'Neill, if he's with us. Um, so from your experience, what do you think the public health sector should expect from the veterinary side in relation to ensure preparedness for the next pandemic? Yeah, happy to answer that, Stefano. I mean, obviously, it's critical to have the veterinary side involved, let's face it, from what we've heard already this afternoon. I mean, clearly, uh, the next pandemic will come from an animal source, more than likely. 
And as you're all probably aware, the, 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 the Global Virome Project has been proposed, which plans amazingly to map all the viruses that live in other animals. I mean, they're projecting 2.6 million viruses are predicted. And then when they get genomic sequences of them all, uh, it's a bit like the PREDICT program that ran for a decade. I guess you guys are familiar with that, where they found, I think it was 1,200 new viruses, 160 coronaviruses from that trawl. So now there's a very big ambitious plan to look for all these viruses. There could be as many as, I say, 2.6 million of them. So looking for $4 billion to do this. So clearly that has to be a massive effort between all these different agencies, I guess, to work together with a view to uh, discovering all the huge range of the virome, if you like, and then using the sequences, the genomics of that then, to try and predict where the next pandemic might come from. I mean, it was done with flu, as I guess you all might know. Um, it was you know, shown that five different changes were needed to make the H5N1 virus into one that would really affect humans. They got as far as two, didn't get to the whole five. So, so that sort of thing whereby you take a, a virus in a particular species and then try and predict how it might jump into humans and what the changes that might be needed for that to happen. So, so it's a complicated thing, but I think obviously there has to be a collaborative effort here with the veterinary side, given the number of coronaviruses that infect other, other species. Thanks a lot. Very interesting point from your side. So, um, good more in detail on, on the next topic would, would be uh, biosecurity. So, biosecurity is a cornerstone of infectious disease control, both for animal and public health side. On the vet side, hygiene protocol and farm biosecurity are a common practice for preventing uh, infectious diseases. Uh, Professor O'Neill, I would like uh, to have a comment from you about the role of biosecurity or hygiene on the public health side in coping with such kind of diseases. Yeah, but again, that's what we're all doing, isn't it? I mean, it's essential. Clearly, the only response that we have to this virus at the moment is medieval in a way. So social distancing, quarantine, obviously, you know, I guess the wearing of masks has become absolutely central as a strategy here. You see hand washing and all the usual hygiene things as well to limit, limit transmission. And these things are working, remember. So all those hygiene practices that would be very familiar in an ag agricultural sector, it seems. Uh, are all the more relevant now for humans to stop the spread of this virus. And then I think, as, as, as was said earlier by, by Mark, you know, the idea that this, this particular virus loves bats and spreads between bats, uh, the, the old crowded, uh, the three C's, as we call them, the bats seem to fulfill all three C's and makes this virus very, very transmissible between bats. So crowded spaces, which in the human case is, say, a bar, shall we say, as opposed to a cave if you're a bat, uh, close contact, again, happens in between humans as well, just like, just like it does in bats as well. And then closed spaces, that's, that's a cave for a bat. It's a bat, it's like an enclosed space for a human. So we learn a lot from the bats in terms of the transmissibility of this particular virus. And then we mitigate against them by trying to do things like distance, you know, hygiene, mask wearing, all try to mitigate against those big risk factors. So these are all a very important strategy at the moment to limit the spread of this virus. Thanks a lot. And now to go on the animal health side of it, uh, I would like to ask a question to Dr. Stegeman. Uh, we see African swine fever continue to spread globally. And could you give us some details uh, in your view of the after of hygiene protocols and biosecurity applied at farm level from the veterinary side to try to fight against the spread of this disease or any other transboundary disease in animals? Yeah, thank you for the question. The African swine fever is also a nice disease where we are completely reliant on uh, biosecurity, given that we have no vaccines and no, no, no cure against the disease. And the disease poses a, a particular challenge to us because, well, besides transmission in domestic pig, it has the wild boar reservoir as a, as, as a population where it efficiently transmits. So that means that all efforts have to be on, uh, on biosecurity and, well, Basically, it's actually quite simple because if you prevent uh, to introduce animals from affected areas, if you do not do swill feeding, so you don't feed kitchen waste to, uh, to pigs, which happens every now and then in, in, in backyard systems, uh, and if you prevent uh, excess of wild boar to your premises, uh, then, well, most of the biosecurity should be done, although preventing wild boar from, from entering your premises in the rural area is not that easy given that they uh, are not easily uh, stopped by, uh, by, by fences and, and all kinds of things, but you can do a lot on in, well, not having feet on the, on, on the, on the yard and, and all these kinds, and not having outdoor pigs uh, to do so. 
well, in addition, of course, your your workers need uh, to uh, comply with the biosecurity, and and uh, you should uh, not have trucks without good uh, cleaning and disinfection on your on your premises. So, in in theory, it's it's actually easier to prevent uh, African swine fever from entering than classical swine fever uh, from entering. But in reality, it's it's much more uh, complicated because of this reservoir in in wild birds. Or in wild boar, and and also because well, uh, a vaccine is an easy thing to do. So you implement it once, uh, it, well, in the lifetime or a few times in the lifetime of an animal, and the animal is protected. Whereas biosecurity is a thing that you need to do 24/7. Uh, so you need also to comply with the scheme uh, when you are in a hurry or when you have little little time. Uh, so so compliance is really the thing that is most difficult, and so uh, to really make progress there. At least on commercial farms, it is really needed that they make farm-specific uh, biosecurity plans that really fit to the uh, to the situation at hand, and that uh, are also uh, well can be quite easily complied with 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 the workers. Uh, so compliance is, I think, a more an issue there than that we uh, do not know enough. Thank you very much for your valuable inputs. So. We said what we do uh, for controlling this disease is through biosecurity, but what should we do to prepare for preventing or responding to emerging diseases? Well, we know that early detection is fundamental. So what do we have to do to detect these emerging diseases that potentially can lead to pandemics as early as possible? And I would like to ask a first question to Professor Wang. Uh, so what kind of surveillance gave in your view are the best shot at early detecting uh, to effectively management, manage spillover events from wildlife? And how can we prevent the spread of animal diseases during an emergency? Uh, we would like, in your reply, to see you considering aspects of spillover from both wildlife, to wildlife to both human and livestock, if possible. Professor Wang? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And, uh, I was going to make a comment after listening to, you know, Professor Mark Wuhaus. I think we just need uh, more people like Mark, you know. I think that's really important to do more and more this uh, prediction and modeling. So at least uh, we can target, for example, beta coronavirus. You know, we had uh, two major outbreaks. Surely these are the known unknowns that we need to focus. And Luke also mentioned this global virus sort of uh, uh, project. It's very, very ambitious, you know, if we want to do properly. We need a few billion dollars. And uh, one thing that I did not discuss because my talk was supposed to be 10 minutes, you know, so I talked about this wildlife and definition of wildlife, and then I introduced the concept of uh, domestication of wildlife because, as I said, civets and pangolins are farmed, okay? The other aspect, you know, I did not go into, it's kind of a controversial and uh, uh, it's legal versus illegal trading. Now, that's really important to me is that uh, what we have seen in the market, in the, in the Wuhan uh, Huanan seafood market, on the menu, maybe on the menus are legally traded wildlife, but how about this illegally traded, okay? So it's a pity, you know, we could not access, you know, they don't have a good video footage and things like that. And to me that the surveillance you can do a lot of science and you can do really international collaboration. But I think the policy and also the regulations of the market, uh, both at the true wildlife, you know, uh, uh, sort of scenario. And then I call this the second is domesticated wildlife and then the livestock, right? So we have really, to me, it's clearly, I have three different sort of animal uh, 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 populations from the real wild to domesticated, but still largely white, and then the trading can be legal or illegal, then they spill over to animals that can be amplified hosts, like the horses for tender and the pigs for nipper. You know, so I you know, cannot give you a clear cut to say what's the best surveillance. And my view is that it has to be a fully integrated. And definitely, definitely we need more funding and the more policy really guidance. Yeah, over, thank you. Thank you very much, it was very clear. And we'd like to go back to Professor Woolhouse now, as we mentioned. So uh, we know that pathogens are constantly evolving. 
And in relation to preparation for disease X coming along, what system do we need to have in place that can adapt to a novel disease threat? Thank you. I mean, evolution is the main problem if you work on AMR or if you work on influenza, uh, that's clear. But for most pathogens, I would argue that the process of emergence is actually more about ecology than evolution. It's more about standing virus diversity that's out there already and simply spills over into humans at some point. There's um, a dichotomy that we put in the literature a few years ago, tailor-made pathogens versus off-the-shelf pathogens. Um, off the shelf means it crosses over into humans and it's ready to go. It just takes off immediately, which looks to be very like COVID-19, SARS coronavirus 2. Tailor made are the ones that essentially stagger across the species barrier um, and then take off. Uh, we, we've, we've looked at this very carefully. We, we can't find any good examples where a strictly zoonotic virus, so like rabies, has evolved into one with epidemic potential. It, it seems to have to go come from the animal reservoir. Um, so, if the problem is about standing diversity rather than new diversity, then the problem is already there to be found, and that brings us straight back to these large-scale surveys of viral diversity in animal reservoirs, um, like the Global Virome Project. So, like Luke, I think there's a, a good case to be made for that. It's come in for a lot of criticism in the academic literature, but quite frankly, the critics seem to have got it wrong, and we do need to revisit the idea. Uh, I will make one prediction, though. I don't think they'll find anywhere near 2.6 million new species of virus, nothing like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I would like to ask you a second question, if I may. Um, so in order to prevent future spillover events, uh, you mentioned in your presentation some of the critical drivers of emergence that should be considered. Uh, from a veterinary point of view, what role can best science and animal health offer to optimally mitigate some of these drivers? Thank you. I, I do think we have to be really careful about this one. The, the recognized drivers of emergence include things like urbanization, changing land use and development, global travel and trade, obviously trade in animals and animal products. And it, I think it's very hard to see how we can justify rejigging the global economy as a preventative measure, although we do seem hell-bent on doing it as a responsive measure right now this minute. Um, but that, that is very difficult. Um, I don't think we can just people stop doing what they're doing. As um, people have already remarked, uh, uh, Lynn Farr in particular, attention always falls specifically on wet markets. Um, and and that's, that's a difficult issue. I've seen at first hand the powerful socioeconomic drivers of wet markets. So I, I think that has to come down to national governments in the region. They want to take that route. And those of us in the UK can hardly point fingers here. We gave the world BSE. So uh, this, this can happen anywhere. Um, tackling wildlife reservoirs brings you into direct conflict with conservation issues. Um, and again, take the UK. We have a continuing battle in the UK about budget, badger culling and bovine TB control here. So that's very difficult too. And drivers like climate and biodiversity, we can't manipulate those at all. So I'm, I'm skeptical of preventative interventions on a global scale. And that brings us right back to this question of detecting emerging infections quickly and responding just as quickly. Thank you. It's perfect, very clear. Um, we have seen during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, that one collateral but serious aspect has been the significant reduced human activities due to lockdown. And this has an impact on some essential veterinary activities, such as preventative measures against diseases, which also have a significant public health and economic impact. And so these have been carried out at the uh, lower intensity or even suppressed during the lockdown. I would like to ask to Dr. Stegeman, uh, what are in your view the vet activities that are expected to be most affected by this current lockdown or in any other lockdown that could happen in a similar situation? I think actually it's quite similar to what happens in human health so that all kind of non-essential visits uh, have not taken place. So that means also for for example, a lot of uh, veterinarians have regular farm visits that, uh, well, they would uh, to, to kind of supervise the farm, supervise the health on the farms uh, that may not have taken place for some time. Uh, and, and the effect of that could obviously have been, uh, well, some welfare deteriorations for the uh, for the animals at, at hand. Also, uh, uh, other, other programs, so uh, 
for example, a thing like passive surveillance, which is important for the detection of diseases on farms, may have been at a, at a lower level during that period. Uh, surveillance programs for uh, kind of organized diseases like salmonella, where sample collection uh, may not have taken place for a while, which may uh, have, have, uh, have been at, at a set, setback. And also uh, more regulated uh, programs. For example, at some point during the pandemics, uh, we heard that there was actually too, too little capacity for testing of humans uh, because, well, reagents for the PCR were un unavailable. And that also had their effect, for example, on, on bird flu uh, monitoring in, in wild birds across Europe because all the, the, the reagents and also the testing capacity was used for human tests and not for animal, uh, animal tests. So there are quite a number of, of issues where also there was an effect on, on animal health and, well, to what extent that has resulted in, in, uh, in less animal welfare is uh, unclear. It's also not clear whether it, uh, well, the, the total benefit uh, or the total effect is, is, uh, is, is negative because, on the other hand, there have also been less contacts between farms, so there have been less opportunities for transmission of pathogens between farms, which may have uh, been a positive effect. Thanks a lot. It is, it is interesting to see how really uh, the one health area is interconnected. So we have uh, really an impact of uh, this mostly human disease on uh, veterinary activities as well, and then animal health as a consequence. Um, I would like to talk a bit about uh, control tools now, because uh, another fundamental aspect to cope with during such kind of events is the availability and use of diagnostic tests and vaccine, as well as therapeutics. Um, so I would like to discuss with some of you experts around the table about the role of disease control tools in this framework. So how the development of new diagnostic, therapeutics, and vaccine can help to cope with the different phases of a pandemic. Um, since you're here, Dr. Stegeman, I would like to ask you, uh, in your view, which are the key diagnostic tests required during different phases of a pandemic, and what do you need to improve for the development and validation? Um, and sorry, before you start, I see that we are running late, so I just ask all of you uh, if you can provide very uh, short answer as much as possible, please. Thank yes, you. so I will not give you an, an enormous list of tests. I think it's, well, it's important to have a test where you can de detect the pathogen and it's a test where you can de detect its immune response. And we had that, I think, in COVID-19. The, the, the bigger problem is, do we have sufficient capacity to test? Uh, because I think that was, an, uh, that was a big issue because at least from the veterinary perspective, it's quite strange that you, you follow the success of your control programs in humans by the, the availability of, of uh, intensive care beds. Uh, so, so you would need to have much more capacity to be able to really follow the infection and also to have important epidemiological parameters like incidence rate, case fatality rate, morbidity rate, because they're really important to feed the models that you use to, to kind of predict the effect of your intervention. So, the supply and sufficient uh, availability of these tests is, I think, more important than, uh, well, to really have uh, more sophisticated tests. Thanks a lot for coming here. Uh, and then moving to vaccine, I would like to ask Dr. Odone, uh, which technologies would, in your view, could speed up the availability of effective vaccines? Um, uh, in fact, the technology is um, that to be targeted are the ones providing the capacity. It's the same issue as for diagnostics. You, you don't want to go for the best vaccines in the world. You don't want to have an ideal vaccine, but just something that will provide a very large volume in terms of the number of doses, rapid distribution, rapid cycle, and possibly stable vaccines uh, enabling a large distribution uh, all over the world. Because the vaccine tool is really key when you want to to stop an outbreak by providing the immunity. Um, today, if you look at the vaccine tracker for COVID-19 um, candidate vaccines, there are over 200 um, projects ongoing, but very few are able, in fact, to be manufactured. So I would reverse the issue by looking, we need to start with something that can be manufactured. So it's a kind of compromise that you have with the ideal vaccine profile and something which is really practical and can be delivered, even if it means that you, you, you give two shots. 
what is important is we need to, pro to provide and immunize uh, a very large percentage of the population, so at least 80% uh, or, or 85% in order to, to block the outbreak. Hello, that's, that's very clear. Um, now I would like to move to therapeutics and ask a very quick uh, comment from Professor O'Neill about what technologies could speed up the availability of effective therapeutics. Yeah, I think that's an easy one, Stefano. In my opinion, it's the antibody technologies are fantastic now. So it's, in my opinion, it's likely the first therapy will be a therapeutic antibody. We know from convalescent plasma that we can use that as a therapy already. There's great technologies to make monoclonals, single chain antibodies, and many of these are in development. There's 43 separate antibodies now in development as a potential therapy. So I think that technology has advanced a lot in the last few years. That's the one I would highlight. Thanks a lot. Um, so another thing that uh, might uh, help in the acceleration preparedness to cope with zoonotic emergencies might be developing better animal models. So Professor Wang, uh, do you have any view on this? Yes, thank you, Stefano. I mean, I see these two roles that animal models can pre uh, really play. One is before pandemic, so it's a really in pandemic preparedness. The other is during pandemic response. So the latter, the latter part is easy, right? Right now, for example, we need animal models for vaccines, for monoclonal antibodies, for drugs. But this pandemic also really reveals several issues to me. One is that the supply, you know, like the ACE2, humanized ACE2 mice, you know, the Jackson Labs, the only supply. And from SARS days, we knew that, you know, you need this kind of mice to do all the tests and then the supply was kind of stopped. They could not supply enough. Secondly is to standardize it. Everybody is using their own virus, their own animal models, and the data is everywhere, you know, so that's difficult. The, the first scenario is to use animal models actually for pandemic preparedness. So it come back to, you know, Mark's research and our kind of research again is uh, uh, I always say, you know, the, uh, totally unknown, unknown is difficult, but the known unknowns, we can do some study. For example, beta coronavirus. We know there's so many beta coronavirus from bats. So you can do some preemptive studies using animal models to do susceptibility transmission. So that's, I think, uh, you know, if internationally we can really collaborate, uh, standardize the models and share reagents, then we can do much better. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And Professor O'Neill, you're still here with us. So can yep. I ask you the very same question yeah, to your sure. perspective about it? Well, again, it's been said already. I guess it's, it's very important as I face, especially macaques with the vaccine programs, for instance, but also the inflammatory, which is my specialty, the inflammatory side of this situation. There's hamster models, there's, there's the humanized mouse, there's also ferrets, of course. So they're all really important test experimental therapies in. Uh, a second aspect is timing of therapy is extremely important because if you give it too early, you might make things worse. If you give it too late, you'll have missed the opportunity. So that's an, a, the sort of a kinetics of it, I think, is really important as well. So, I mean, can we get better models? It's always good to have better animal models, you know. I think the other thing to say would be, apart from animal models, organoids are emerging as a very interesting technology now to test new drugs in, and they're beginning to recapitulate certain tissues ex vivo, which means we might need as many animal models. They'll complement the in vivo stuff and animal models, I guess, as we, as we, as we go forward. And the technology and that's improving as well because of COVID-19. Thanks a lot. That was very clear. So a last question on the control tools to go back to vaccine uh, with Dr. Odene. So from your experience in developing vaccine, what would be the main bottleneck to ensure the timely release of a new vaccine? Uh, I'll come back also to what Professor Lin Fa Wang said. The yes. animal model is certainly a, a key bottleneck because that you need this model to validate your, your vaccine, the activity. If you don't have it, you have to rely on the animal rule or a good guess that the selected subunit has been active. And we can take the example of beta coronaviruses where now we have the MERS corona SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, for which the RBD has been um, a key protective immunogen, at least in some animal models. So you, it's a good guess to, to start with that. But the key uh, point will be also to have a very rapid cycle time. Um, and that's what I described in my slide. 
for a regulatory uh, approval and to, to build confidence and trust with regulatory bodies in that the technology you are using for manufacturing is very safe for the vaccine and for the environment. So you don't have a lot of choice. I think it will come back to, to subunits, possibly in, with limited adjuvant or non-adjuvant like uh, uh, aluminum gel for people, but we have a larger choice in, uh, in veterinary species. And that gives us some good flexibility to act very fast. Again, not looking for the best vaccine in the world, but the vaccine we can produce at the largest uh, scale. Thanks a lot. Uh, but the key, the key point uh, in terms of bottleneck but it, that is true right now for SARS-CoV-2 is not really the manufacturing part I mean, in, in raw material, but the fill and finish lines, which are in the limited amounts around the world. That's very interesting. Thanks a lot for, your, for sharing your experience with us. Um, I would like to open the last part of this round table that is about uh, risk management. So we, uh, we discussed already about the role of research in ensuring the development of adequate uh, infectious disease prevention and control tools. Uh, so are the current research management practices appropriate for facing pandemics? And how could this be improved? And I would like to have the impression about it of Dr. Uh, Jean-Charles Cavite. Uh, so what kind of new approach for research funding and management could be implemented under, for example, Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe, and other European programs to improve preparedness by all sectors for future threats. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, yes. You. Okay. Yeah, Jean-Charles Cavite speaking. Um, sorry, first, maybe I have to, to warn that coming more from the veterinary angle, I will not be able to give many examples. I don't know very well what's uh, happening on the public health, in the medical research uh, sector, where uh, the budget and initiatives, uh, many of them exist, uh, and, and we don't have uh, similar things in the, in the veterinary sector. So at, at uh, the European Commission, we are um, funders of research through the framework program, and we essentially uh, fund transnational research activities, which is maybe a bit different from, from what happens in the, in the countries themselves. But I say so because it, it's, putting, it's making things sometimes uh, more difficult and more lengthy to organize uh, calls for research. But I insist on this because international collaboration, whether within Europe or beyond globally, is very important. Now, the question is about funding and management during emergency, and maybe we have to, to think based on what we've heard, actually, that there are two elements. There are maybe a number of things that need to be prepared before in peacetime and then react quickly, if possible, during uh, an emergency. And from this point of view, we are, uh, I think, better equipped to, to prepare in peacetime than, than react uh, to um, emergencies. Still, even if we don't, from the research funding point of view, if we don't have, a, let's say, a, a standard emergency fund, uh, we can still react uh, reasonably quickly with certain exceptions to the rules of, of competitive goals, for instance. When there is really a justified emergency, there can be actions taken which are uh, a bit faster. And you see that this what that's what happened, for instance, a few years ago about the Ebola crisis, uh, where very quickly money was mobilized at EU level to um, undertake some uh, research activities with tens of millions of euros. Then it became hundreds of millions of euros, but uh, much later. So we are not we are not that quick, but there are things that can be uh, done quickly. I'd say that also with the COVID-19 crisis, you've probably noticed that a lot of money or commitments were made. Something like one billion euros was mobilized or is mobilized in the Horizon 2020 for the, the, the coronavirus global response, with nearly half a billion uh, for developing scientific solutions for treating and, and preventing against um, coronaviruses. There is uh, 400 million euros, I think, in the, as a guarantee from the European Investment Bank for lending to, to finance uh, pre-commercial stage investments in COVID-19, uh, including scale-up of, of related uh, production facilities. 
and uh, over 100 million um, for kind of uh, potentially disruptive innovation on, on COVID-19 under the, the European Innovation Council. But as you see, and, and I think this is an important aspect for me coming from the veterinary angle, is uh, these justified emergencies, they are essentially there when you have a public health emergency. And when we speak here, I think the, suddenly the public health impact of emergencies, uh, infectious diseases, is mostly um, there and, and enables taking action. It's much more difficult in the veterinary sector. Um, if you look at the budgets and the horizon 2020 for the medical sector for one single species, a very important one, of course, humans. <laughs> uh, you have a, a serious amount of money, and uh, in, in our domain, uh, we have to deal with animals, plants, aquatic and terrestrial animals, rural development, etc., with, with less money. So you can imagine that it's, it's much more difficult to mobilize huge amounts of, of money. And I come back to the idea of this international cooperation or transnational cooperation to enable uh, leveraging and, and, and trying to have synergies rather than duplications of, of efforts. So we, we can certainly respond, respond to emergencies. I think one way to go around this is um, having uh, either open-ended projects dealing specifically with emergencies and projects that could then adapt to the situation and target new uh, pathogens, for instance, uh, when, they, when they come up. That's one option that we use from time to time, but it's not very flexible into the grant system of European projects. Another one would be to have a kind of partnerships, like those who know maybe in, in Europe, the ERANETs, and there will be uh, other types of partnerships under Horizon Europe that would be bigger ones. Well, in those partnerships, you have more flexibility to uh, maybe undertake uh, or launch calls a bit uh, more quickly than uh, in the European um, system, let's say, European Commission, where in the European Commission, we will have work program with calls for two years, predefined ones, so we cannot adapt it. But if you see partnerships like if we compare to the ones in the medical sector, the Innovative Medicine Initiative, where call can be organized every year and even maybe quick more quickly if if necessary so i think these kind of structures can can help now what can be done as well is i said we need to work in in peace time to prepare and when we prepare we can try and anticipate i, I heard about the let's say the, uh, assessing the risks and uh, rather than surveying or together with surveying pathogens um, so looking at signals uh, to uh, help anticipate these issues, but like was mentioned, is uh, what do we do when we know where the risks are? Uh, are, are the policymakers ready to take decisions to um, uh, avoid uh, those or reduce those risks to, to a ne negligible level? But there are a number of things that need to be done, I think, in peacetime, like uh, modeling. We've heard about the data. Um, needs important ones to to um, uh, uh, mix the data and and uh, make understanding better of the diseases like this capacity building because you need we will need the people the scientists and maybe beyond be prepared to the new technologies to the um, epidemiology of diseases so we can do a number of things there uh, but that's that's different from reacting during really emergencies, and that's really something there. Uh, quite frankly, we, we had raised this issue at the moment of preparing for Horizon Europe to say, hey, how can could we uh, react more quickly to emergencies? Well, that was not taken up, and I don't think uh, for the moment there is a, a specific uh, plan to um, change this system. As I said, if they are really justified emergencies, they can be, you know, uh, extra and ad hoc measures that can be that can be taken again it's more likely to be possible to do it in the medical sector than in in the veterinary sector for instance when uh, african swine fever started to spread in in europe uh, beyond the baltic states a few years ago the question was raised uh, whether we should go for the emergency measure 
to uh, develop research activities urgently for, for ASF, and that was not taken up. So um, that's that's the situation that we that we have. That's it. I think I was long enough. But if there are questions, happy to reply. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Dr. Kavit. It was very clear, and I think you draw some very interesting conclusions about. Uh, also, the the outcomes of this meeting. Do do you have any very brief final uh, comments you want to give about uh, um, the different ideas that emerged during this web event and how they could help in shaping uh, future research initiative or research management in Europe and beyond? Uh, you, you also mentioned you already mentioned uh, research coordination, research cooperation, uh, working in peacetime. Uh, but if you have any uh, very final uh, remark about it? That's well, it. yes, I would have, but I think it's it's reasonably well known. I think the examples that were presented, like the ZAPI project and the IMI, um, or other the surveillance uh, or the, the the risk identification of what. The, um, Viruses, for instance, could be more uh, likely to lead to uh, uh, panzootics or pandemics is certainly very important. I think the technologies development could probably bring new possibilities into the surveillance or even anticipation of, um, of potential panzootics or pandemics. Um, the um, reactivity we heard about, for instance, this new generation serology. <laughs> I like this concept, why not? I think having detection system that can, can detect the unknown in a way, uh, quickly, easily, uh, that's, that's the dream. But for this, uh, there, is a lot of, there is a lot of needs. We heard about billions uh, uh, from some uh, participants here, speakers, billions needed for this. And uh, it, 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 it will require um, mobilization, as I said, uh, international cooperation, but also probably mobilization of, of policymakers that decide to put funds in research or not. And my feeling is so far that animal health uh, research funding uh, tends to decrease rather than increase. I don't know if the COVID crisis will, will help reversing a little bit this issue. But as I said, in, in the animal production or animal health, you have the issue of uh, antimicrobial resistance, you have the issue of animal welfare, you have the issue of pandemics or panzootics. So it's important, but it looks like not many people uh, are, are um, matching <laughs> uh, the concerns of society or public health issues uh, with, with uh, money. For research in this area. So I think we need to be very creative, very clever in the way we can make the best out of what we what we have. Um, that's it. But one message for me is I heard about um, One Health. Okay. What we've seen with the COVID or SARS is that the medical um, sector is driving the things. For me, One Health, to some extent, should incorporate in a balanced way animal health and possibly pure animal disease as well. Because when we think of uh, emerging infectious disease, we don't know when they emerge. Well, we may not know whether they are zoonotic or not. And they may well be uh, lead to panzootics. It's quite seldom, I guess, that we have uh, at the same time with the same pathogen, panzootics and pandemics in, in, in humans. And I think it's very important to look at this and, and how one else is to be operationalized. I think one else is certainly extremely important in transdisciplinary activities when it comes to understanding epidemiology, uh, following, monitoring. Now, when it goes into um, reacting or preparing, when you start to develop uh, treatments, vaccines, etc., I think the cooperation may be useful, but you can have very different uh, communities, very different industries. We can see actually even in the private uh, businesses that um, there are not so many companies that do animal health and uh, human health in the same company any longer. Um, and, and so we, we have to see how far this cooperation um, needs to be um, operationalized in a way. 
but it's certainly a very important uh, issue, at least uh, for, for understanding uh, uh, the epidemiology and following this. So that's that's what I, I could uh, pull out uh, quickly from this from these discussions. Thanks a lot. It was very, very useful. And I think you provided a very nice overview of the different um, issues that are still uh, on the ground that we need to face and we would need to face in the future, but also you provided some idea about what would be potential way for uh, targeting these issues and eventually get into a better management of future outbreaks and better prevention of future pandemic or uh, emerging disease uh, in general. Uh, with this, I would like to close the event. First of all, I want to thank a lot all of our speakers that have been with us uh, all along. Uh, your contribution has been really invaluable. Uh, we really much appreciate it, as I'm sure all participants did. We want to thank a lot the audience. You stay with us until the end. We are still about 300 participants are still on the line, even if we are about 50 minutes late. So we're very happy of it. Uh, please remember that all the inputs you saw gently provided through the Mentimeter will be analyzed and uh, presented in your report will be made available soon on the organizer's uh, website. I would also like to thank a lot again the scientific committee as well as the CWG and the Slidus IRC for organizing this event and putting everything together and the Slidus IRC secretariat for providing uh, financial support for the organization of this webinar. And of course, all the other event supporters, this controls Animal Health Europe, iCrud, and the One Health AGP. Um, having, having said this, I wish you all a good morning, afternoon, evening, and I hope you enjoyed this event. Goodbye. <laughs>